Shalom. All right, so my first disclaimer is that I don't have my um, microphone condenser, so I am literally talking to you on my headphones. You might hear a lot of background noises every time I have an important message. Um, it seems like everybody in the entire state drives past my house and it's very loud, and then it's been raining, so it's even louder. And sometimes there's a train, so I hope that the background noises don't um, distract you. Um, my next disclaimer is the topic that I'm about to speak on. Um, please keep in mind that there are people that have spent years upon years upon years um, studying and breaking down this message. Um, Ruach HaKodesh did tell me to go forth with it because there is a necessity for it to be heard right now. However, understand that I am not perfect. I am not a scholar. I literally just... Um, do the research on my own. I allow Ruach HaKadosh to lead me to this, to lead me to that, and to show me in his word where what I heard him say is true. As always, I encourage you to take the scripture references that I put in the description and to go research on your own. And I'm going to do a lot of reading with you as well. So, but still go read it. Don't take my word for it. Um, also, www.blueletterbible.org is an extra biblical uh, tool that I like to use. Um, it doesn't just show you what the Greek and Hebrew word was used in the scripture. It has an interlinear Bible. It has biblical commentaries. It has the Septuagint. It has the lexicon. It has every single thing that you could possibly think of and need in order to do your own research and it is free that is the, that is the most amazing thing you can download um, the app or you can just access it online me personally I prefer to access it access it online because it's easier to navigate than on the app just my preference but whatever all right so the topic that I'm about to speak of is how when you give your life to Yeshua HaMashiach you become an Israelite I know I lost somebody right there, but for those of you that stayed, <laughs> please bear with me. I have scriptures to back this up and we're going to just go through them. I'm going to take my time because this is a very um, crucial topic that every believer needs to hear because this right here is going to determine if you continue to believe or if you continue to, or if you stop believing at this point. So I don't take this topic lightly. I will read slow and I will move at my own pace, hence the length of the video. All right, so let's dive into it. So Deuteronomy 23 verses three to four reads, an Ammonite or Moabite shall not enter the assembly of the Lord, even to the 10th generation, none of his descendants shall enter the assembly of the Lord forever because they did not meet you with bread and water on the road when you came out of Egypt and because they hired you Balaam um, and because they hired against you Balaam, the son of Beor from Pather of Mesopotamia to curse you. So the story of Balaam is something that most believers is pretty are pretty familiar with. You can find the complete story in Numbers chapters 22 to 24. I am going to read you portions from each of the three chapters that I just mentioned. I'm not going to read the whole thing because they're pretty long. Um, but so basically the king of Moab, Balak, and the princes of Moab were afraid of the Israelites because they saw that they were numerous. Hence the reason why the story is in the book of Numbers. All right. And their numbers was actually according to a promise that Yahweh had given to Abraham. And we'll get into that a little bit later. So um, if you go to Numbers 22... I am only going to read verse 5, but I want you to read 
Well, f- let me just read verse 5 for you real quick. Then he, this is Balak, sent messengers to Balaam, the son of Beor, P- Pather, which is near the river in the land of the sons of his people, to call him, saying, Look, a people has come from Egypt. See, they cover the face of the earth and are settling next to me. So um, Balak sends the princes of Moab out to Balaam because he wants him to curse the people. Um, He wants him to curse the Israelites. So starting in verse 7, this is kind of how it goes. And please bear with me because I'm going to read this all the way down to verse 40. All right. So, so the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian. Now, I want you to keep that in mind. The elders of Moab and Midian, okay, departed with the diviner's fee in their hand. And they came to Balaam and spoke to him the words of Balak. So these are two pagan nations. They went with a diviner's fee. So whenever you want to go to a diviner, that's someone who practices divination, you take to them a fee. It's a specific fee. I did not look to see what that fee is, but they were they brought this to Balaam, the prophet. And it says, um, and he said to them, lodge here tonight. And I will bring back word to you as the Lord speaks to me. So the princes of Moab stayed with Balaam. Then God came to Balaam and said, Who are these men with you? So Balaam said to God, Balak, the son of Zippor, king of of Moab, has sent to me saying, Look, a people has come out of Egypt and they cover the face of the earth. Come now, curse them for me. Perhaps I shall be able to overpower them and drive them out. And God said to Balaam, You shall not go with them. You shall not curse the people, for they are blessed. So Balaam rose in the morning and said to the princes of Balak, Go back to your land, for the Lord has refused to give me permission to go with you. And the princes of Moab rose and went to Balak and said, Balaam refuses to come with us. Then Balak again sent princes more numerous and more honorable than they. And they came to Balaam and said to him, Thus says Balak, the son of Zippor, Please let nothing hinder you from coming to me, for I will certainly honor you greatly, and I will do whatever you say to me. Therefore, please come, curse this people for me. Then Balaam answered and said to the servants of Balak, Though Balak were to give me his house full of silver and gold, I could not go beyond the word of the Lord my God to do less or more. Now, therefore, please, you also stay here tonight that I may know what more the Lord will say to me. And God came to Balaam at night and said to him, If the men come to call you, rise and go with them. But only the word which I speak to you that you shall do. So Balaam rose in the morning, saddled his donkey, and went with the princes of Moab. Then God's anger was aroused because he went, and the angel of the Lord took his stand in the way of an adversary against in the way as an adversary against him, and he was riding on his donkey. And his two servants were with him. Now the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his drawn sword in his hand. And the donkey turned aside out of the way and went into the field. So Balaam struck struck the donkey to turn her back onto the road. Then the angel of the Lord stood in a narrow path between the vineyards with a wall on the side and a wall on that side. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she pushed herself against the wall and crushed Balaam's foot against the wall. So he struck her again. Then the angel of the Lord went further and stood in a narrow place where there was no way to turn either to the right hand or to the left. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she lay down under Balaam. So Balaam's anger was aroused and he struck the donkey with his staff. Then the Lord opened the mouth of the donkey and she said to Balaam, what have I done to you that you have struck me these three times? And Balaam said to the donkey, because you have abused me, I wish there was a sword there were a sword, I'm sorry, in my hand, for now I would kill you. So the donkey said to Balaam, Am I not your donkey on which you have ridden ever since I became yours to this day? Was I ever disposed to do this to you? And he said, No. Then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way, and his drawn sword in his hand, and he bowed his head and fell flat on his face. And the angel of the Lord said to him, Why have you struck your donkey these three times? Behold, I have come out to stand against you, because your way is perverse before me. The donkey saw me and turned aside from me, because, I mean, these three times, 
If she had not turned aside from me, surely I would have also killed you by now and let her live. And Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned, for I did not know you stood in the way against me. Now therefore, if it displeases you, I will turn back. Then the angel of the Lord said to Balaam, Go with the men, but only the word that I speak to you, that you shall speak. So Balaam went with the princes of Balak. Now when Balak heard that Balaam was coming, he went out to meet him at the city of Balaam, I mean Moab, I'm sorry, which is on the border at the Arnon, the boundary of the territory. Then Balak said to Balaam, did I not earnestly send you calling for you? Why did you not come to me? Am I not able to honor you? And Balaam said to Balak, look, I have come to you. Now, have I any power to say anything to say at all? I'm sorry. Now, have I any power at all to say anything? The word that God puts in my mouth, must I sp- that must I, I must speak. So Balaam went with Balak, and they came to Kir- um, Kirjath Huzoth. Then Balak offered oxen and sheep, and he sent some to Balaam and to the princes who were with him. And I'll just read verse 41. So it was the next day that Balak took Balaam and brought him up on the high places of Baal, that from there he might observe the extent of the people. All right, so you have this um, exchange that's going on. And he's trying to tell him, you know, like, there's a lot of people out here. You know, I don't know who these people are. It's a lot of them. I need you to curse them for me. And I'm not going to go into the details of why the, you know, the angel of the Lord withstood Balaam. There's all kinds of speculation behind that, but that's not the point of um, this message. So we're just going to skip over that, but I just want you guys to know I'm not ignoring it. I'm just being obedient to what the Lord has told me to say. (laughs) All right. So um, if you jump over to Numbers 23, starting at verse 7. It reads, and he took up his oracle and said, so I'm going to stop there. So the Hebrew word for oracle is mashal, which means parable. So a parable is usually a short fictitious story that illustrates a moral attitude or a religious principle. It's instructive. It's an instructive example or lesson. I'm sorry, you guys, I'm getting very tongue tied. So starting at verse seven, and he took up his oracle and said, Balak, the king of Moab, has brought me from Aram, from the mountains of the east. Come, curse Jacob for me, and come, denounce Israel. How shall I curse whom God has not cursed, and how shall I denounce whom the Lord has not denounced? For from the top of the rocks I see him, and from the hills I behold him. There a people dwelling alone, not reckoning itself among the nations. Who can count the dust of Jacob? Or number one-fourth of Israel. Let me die the death of the righteous and let my end be like his. Then Balak said to Balaam, What have you done to me? I took you to curse my enemies, and look, you have blessed them bountifully. So he answered and said, Must I not take heed to speak what the Lord has put in my mouth? All right, so this actually happens four times. I am going to read all four times, but this is the, um, the, um, first prophecy that Balaam gives and as you can imagine Balak is pretty perturbed (laughs) so starting in verse 13 it says then Balak said to him please come to me to another place from which you may see them you shall see you shall see only the outer part of them and shall not see them all curse them for me from there so he brought him to the field of Zophim to the top of Pisgah and built seven altars and offered a bull and a ram on each altar and he said to Balak stand here by your burnt offering while I meet the Lord over there then the Lord met Balaam and put a word in his mouth and said go back to Balak and thus you shall speak so he came to him and there he was standing by his burnt offering and the princes of Moab were with him and Balak said to him what has the Lord spoken Then he took up his oracle and said, Rise up, Balak, and hear. Listen to me, son of Zippor. God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent, which means turn away from or turn back from. Has he said, and will he not do? Or has he spoken, and will he not make it good? 
Behold, I have received a command to bless. He is blessed and I cannot reverse it. He has not observed iniquity in Jacob, nor has he seen wickedness in Israel. The Lord his God is with him, and the shot of a king is among them. God brings them out of Egypt. He has strength like a wild ox, for there is no sorcery against Jacob, nor any div divination against Israel. It now must be said of Jacob and of Israel, Oh, what God has done! Look! A people rises like a lioness and lifts itself like a lion, and it shall not lay down until it devours the prey and drinks the blood of the slain. Then Balak said to Balaam, Neither curse them at all, nor bless them at all. So Balaam answered and said to Balak, Did I, did I not tell you, saying, All that the Lord speaks that I must do? Continuing on in verse 27 of um, Numbers 23 says, Then Balak said to Balaam, Please come, I will take you to another place. Perhaps it will please God that you may curse them for me from there. So Balak just wasn't getting it. Like Yahweh wasn't finna curse his people because why would he curse the people that he just brought up out of Egypt? That didn't make any sense, but Balak wasn't getting it. He was being stiff-necked. So Balak took Balaam to the top of Peor, the overlook's that overlooks the wasteland then Balaam said to Balak build for me here seven altars and prepare for me here seven bulls and seven rams and Balak did as Balaam had said and offered a bull and a ram on every altar all right so starting in verse 20 I mean chapter 24 at verse 1 it reads now when Balaam saw that it pleased the Lord to bless Israel he did not go as at other times to seek to use sorcery he did not go as at other times to seek to use sorcery. All right. You remember he got the diviner's fee, divination. Okay. But he set his face toward the wilderness and Balaam raised his eyes and saw Israel encamped according to their tribes and the spirit of God came upon him. So now that he's not using sorcery to tell Balak what it is Yahweh said, and, and let's not leave the fact out that he was hearing from Yahweh. Okay, but now the spirit of the Lord is upon him and listen to what the spirit of God has him say. Then he took up his oracle and said, the utterance of Balaam, the son of Beor, the utterance of the man whose eyes are open, the utterance of him who hears the words of God, who sees the vision of the almighty, who falls down with eyes wide open. How lovely are your tents, O Jacob, your dwellings, O Israel, like valleys that stretch out, like gardens by the riverside, like aloes planted by the Lord, like cedars beside the waters. He shall pour water from his buckets, and his seed shall be in many waters. His king shall be higher than Agag, and his kingdom shall be exalted. God brings him out of Egypt. He has strength like a wild ox. He shall consume the nations, his enemies. He shall break their bones and pierce them with his arrows. His bo he bows down, he lies down as a lion. And as a lion, who shall rouse him? Blessed is he who blesses you, and cursed is he who curses you. Keep that in mind. Then Balak's anger was aroused against Balaam, and he struck his hands together. And Balak said to Balaam, I called you to curse my enemy, and look, you have bountifully blessed them these three times now therefore flee to your place i say i would greatly honor you but in fact the lord has kept you back from honor so balaam said to balak did i not also speak to your messengers whom you sent to me saying if balak were to give me his house full of silver and gold i could not go beyond the word of the lord to do good or bad of my own will what the lord says that i must speak and now indeed i am going to my people Come, I will advise you what this people will do to your people in the latter days. This is getting pretty heavy, you guys. You know, Balak is is really, he really out here trying uh, to curse the people of Israel. But I just, this is the reason why it's important for you to know that you are Israel. Because when you know this, when you see how, how your God fights for you, you need to know that you are Israel. Okay? So I'm going to finish out chapter 24, starting at verse 15. This is the fourth and final prophecy that Balaam gives to Balak. So he took up his oracle, the utterance of Balaam, the son of Beor, and the utterance of the man whose eyes are open, the utterance of him who hears the words of God, 
and has the knowledge of the Most High, who sees the vision of the Almighty, who falls down with eyes wide open. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, a scepter shall rise out of Israel, and batter the brow of Moab, and destroy all the sons of Tumult. And Edom, that's Esau, that's Jacob's brother, shall be a possession. Seir, also his enemy, shall be a possession, while Israel does valiantly. Out of Jacob one shall have dominion, and destroy the remains of the city. Then he looked on Amalek, And he took up his oracle and said, Amalek was first among the nations, but shall be last until he perishes. Now, remember, the people of Amalek, the Amalekites, was the ones that Saul was supposed to wipe off the face of the planet. Now, it wasn't um, this wasn't the reason why it was because the Amalekites had attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. But I just want you to see that Yahweh is very true to his word and you will see his words being repeated sometimes it's not being repeated sometimes it's just the events happening in the bible are happening simultaneously so it appears that he's he is um repeating himself but he's really you're really just seeing like different viewpoints of the same thing that's going on all right i hope that made sense then he looked on the canaanites and he took up his oracle and said Firm is your dwelling place, and your nest is set in the rock. Nevertheless, Cain shall be burned. How long until Asher carries you away captive? Then he took up his oracle and said, Alas, who shall live when God does this? But ships shall come from the coast of Cyprus, and they shall afflict Asher and afflict Eber. And so shall Amalek until he perishes. So Balaam rose and departed and returned to his place. Balak also went his way. Now you just heard about how Yahweh was, you know, refusing to allow Balaam to curse his people, the Israelites. But now let's go into chapter 25 of Numbers because the very next chapter, you see that Israel starts committing harlotry with Moab. So starting in verse 1. In chapter 25, it says, Now Israel remained, now Israel remained in Acacia Grove, and the people began to commit harlotry with the women of Moab. Okay? They invited, because part of the law was that they should not take any women from the other nations. Okay, so that's, now they're already starting to break the law. They invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel was joined to Baal of Peor, and the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel. I'm going to stop right there. So Baal, Baal of Peor, it just means the Lord of Peor. Baal means Lord. Baal of Peor. So this is a pagan deity that Israel was now joined to. So Israel was joined to Baal of Peor. All right. Then the Lord said to Moses, take all the leaders of the people and hang the offenders before the Lord out in the sun, that the fierce anger of the Lord may turn away from Israel. So Moses said to the judges of Israel, every one of you kill his men who were joined to Baal of Peor. And indeed, one of the children of Israel came and presented to his brethren a Midianite woman in the sight of Moses and in the sight of all the congregation of the children of Israel who were weeping at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Now when Phinehas, the son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw it, he he rose from among the congregation and took a javelin in in his hand and he went after the man of Israel into the tent and thrust them both through the man of Israel and the woman through her body. So the plague was stopped among the children of Israel, and those who died in the plague were 24,000. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, has turned back my wrath from the children of Israel because he was zealous with my zeal among them, so that I did not consume the children of Israel in my zeal. Therefore say, Behold, I give to him my covenant of peace, and it shall be to him and his descendants after him a covenant of an everlasting priesthood because he was zealous for his God and made atonement for the children of Israel. Now the, t- the name of the Israelite who was killed who was killed with the Midianite woman was Zimri the son of Salu, a leader of a father's house among the Simeonites. 
and the name of the Midianite woman who was killed was Cosby, the daughter of Zor. He was head of the people of a father's house in Midian. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Harass the Midianites and attack them, for they harassed you with their schemes, by which they seduced you in the matter of Peor and in the matter of Cosby, the daughter of a leader of Midian, their sister, who was killed in the day of the plague because of Peor. Now here's the thing that I find interesting about this. Verse 16 says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Harass the Midianites and attack them. The reason why I found this interesting is because Moses' wife, Zipporah, is a Midianite, all right? Or at least she was a Midianite. All right, so check this out. Exodus 2, 16 to 25. Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water, and they filled the troughs to water their flock, father's flock. Then the shepherds came and drove them away, but Moses stood up and helped them and watered their flock. When they came to Reuel, the, their father, that's Jethro, he said, How is it that you have come to come so soon today? And they said, An Egyptian delivered us from the hand of the shepherds, and he also drew enough water for us and watered the flock. So he said to his daughters, And where is he? Why is it that you have left the man? Call him, that he may eat bread. Then Moses was content to live with the man, and he gave Zipporah his daughter, and he gave Zipporah his daughter to Moses, and she bore him a son. He called his name Gershom. For he said, I have been a stranger in a foreign land. Now it happened in the process of time that the king of Egypt died. The children of Israel groaned because of the bondage. And they cried out, and their cry came up to God because of the bondage. So God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel, and God acknowledged them. So each one of them, Abraham, Yisak, and Yaakov all received a promise that their descendants would be numerous. All right. So Zipporah is the daughter of Jethro, Reuel, a Midianite priest. But when she married Moses, she became an Israelite. She served his God. She worshiped his God. She was no longer considered a Midianite. Well, here's the thing. This is very common in scripture. So let's go to Ruth. All right. I just want you, I just, I have to kind of take my time and just let you guys see the different things that's going on. Because most of us know these stories, but are we really paying attention to the stories? Because I know I wasn't. So I'm going to be very transparent with that. All right. So Ruth chapter one. It says, Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem, or Judah, went to dwell in the country of Moab. All right, so we're still in Moab. He and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech. The name of his wife was Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Chilion, I'm sorry, Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah. So, okay, let me stop right there. Eth Ephrathites were descendants of Ephraim, who is the son, or well, one of the two sons of Joseph, uh, Manasseh and Ephraim, Ephraim. And before he died, Jacob blessed Joseph's two sons, and he said that from now on, Ephraim and Manasseh, or Manasseh, would be um, as though his own sons. So they actually inherited the, the blessing of a son from their grandfather Joseph did not but Ephraim was given the the blessing of the firstborn son and he was actually the second born to Joseph so that's a whole nother story I'm not going to go off that rabbit trail but I just want you to know that um, Naomi and Elimelech are descendants of Ephraim okay so it says um and they went to the country of Moab and remained there. Then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left and her two sons. Now they took wives of the women of Moab. The name of the, of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other Ruth. And they dwelt there about ten years. Then both Milan and Kilian also died, so the woman survived her two sons and her husband. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law, that she might return from the country of Moab, 
for she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had visited his people by giving them bread. Therefore she went out from the place where she was, and her two daughter-in-laws with her, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. And Naomi said to her two daughter-in-laws, Go, return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest each in the house of her husband. So she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, Surely we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are there still sons in my womb, that they may be your husbands? Turn back, my daughters, go, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband tonight and should also bear sons, would you wait for them till they were grown? Would you restrain yourselves from having husbands? No, my daughters, for it grieves me very much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And she said, Look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Remember, I mean, return after your sister-in-law. I'm going to read that again. Look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. All right. Verse 16. But Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts you and me. When she saw that she was determined to go with her, she stopped speaking to her. So go back up to verse 16. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Right then and there, Ruth denounced the Moabite gods and she proclaimed or attached herself to the people of Israel, calling them her people and their God, Yahweh, her God. She is no longer a Moabitess. Okay? So understand this. This is how this thing works. Okay? But I. I'm not done. I'm not done. I have more to give to you because I, I really want you guys to to see this, okay? So the interesting thing about this, all right, oh, before I go further, let me go back to Deuteronomy 23. An Ammonite or Moabite shall not enter the assembly of the Lord, even to the 10th generation, and none of his descendants shall enter the assembly of the Lord forever. That's at any time. This is what Yahweh had said, right? But now we see a Moabite woman, less than 10 generations from when Yahweh said this, entering into the assembly of the Lord. How is that possible? She denounced her nationality and declared that she was now a an Israelite. And she declared that she would follow after the Israelite God, Yahweh. Now, this was actually very necessary for the entire story. First and foremost, we see in the Old Testament several times where Yahweh is already foreshadowing the fact that he was already planning on grafting in Gentiles into his people. Okay, so you see it even in the lineage of Yeshua HaMashiach. Ruth is part of the lineage of Yeshua HaMashiach. Okay. Her and Boaz had a son named Obed. Obed is the father of Jesse, and Jesse is the father of King David. And we all know that um, Yeshua HaMashiach is the seed of David. All right. But just so you know, I'm not lying to you. Matthew chapter one, starting at verse one, reads the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begot Isaac, Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob begot Judah and his brothers. See, this is where all begots become necessary, all right? Judah begot Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Perez begot Hezron, and Hezron begot Ram. Ram begot Aminadab, and Aminadab begot Nashon. And Nashon begot Salmon, and Salmon begot Boaz by Rahab. 
-hmm. All right, so Boaz's mom was the prostitute Rahab that helped the Israelite spies in Jericho, okay? Boaz begot Obed by Ruth, and Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David the king. And if you continue on in the chapter, you'll see um, eventually it winds up leading to Yeshua Hamashiach. So my next question is, why do you think Yahweh had Kepha, that's Peter's Hebrew name, an unlearned man as the leader of the Jews, and Paul, a former Pharisee, as the leader of the Gentiles? Here's the thing. The Jews already know the law of Moshe. They already know the law of Yahweh. They needed to be taught the proper usage of the law according to how Yeshua HaMashiach taught his disciples the law was supposed to be carried out. Um, because several times in the Gospels, you will actually hear Yeshua, as a matter of fact, Matthew 23, and I'll put this um, reference in the description Matthew 23 he well actually I'm sorry I'm lying it's <laughs> it's Matthew um, 5 17 he says I didn't come to do away with the law but to fulfill it and I've already done this in other videos that is play route which means to obey as it should be okay so if you want to drop down uh, um, if you go to Matthew 28 Starting in verse 16, or Matthew uh, 28, starting in verse 16, it says, Then the eleven disciples went away to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. Then they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Teaching them to observe all the things that I have commanded you. So let's back up just a minute. Yeshua is the word of Yahuwah in the flesh, the word of Yahweh in the flesh. We know that from Yoachanan, John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 2, He was with God in the beginning. We know this to be true, okay? If you believe, you know this to be true. So now he's seeing, saying, teach them to observe all things I have commanded you. So if he's the Word of Yahweh in the flesh, and the Torah is the Word of Yahweh, the law of Yahweh, that means that not only is Yeshua the Torah, he's also the law, all right? That's very key. Hold on to that. <laughs> so the Jews already knew the law. They needed to know the, pur the true purpose of the law. And they needed to know the gospel of Yeshua HaMashiach, what he actually came to do, and how to um, properly observe the law of Yahweh because they weren't getting it right. And it wasn't necessarily their fault, but we're not going to go into all that extra stuff. Video is already going to be long enough. <laughs> So then the Gentiles, he took a former Pharisee who was a teacher of the law, okay? And he put him over the Gentiles. Why? Because the Gentiles don't know the law of Yahweh. So now he has to teach them the law of Yahweh, but he taught them the law of Yahweh according to Jesus Christ, all right? Or Yeshua HaMashiach. So I just wanted to throw that in there. Hopefully you're still with me, but um, I have some scripture to back this up, so I want to go into it. So Acts 4 and 13. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled and they realized that they had been with Yeshua. Okay, so they knew everything that they needed to know about the law because they had been with Yeshua. This implies that Yeshua taught them the law. Okay, because they were Galilean men. Most um, most Jews could not read. It was the nobility and the clergy that knew how to read. So they would have the Torah portions read to them every Sabbath and every sacred Sabbath, which is seven of them. We call them the seven biblical feasts of the Bible. They would have the Torah read to them all, 
every Sabbath and every biblical, I mean, every sacred Sabbath. So this was something that was supposed to be ingrained in their heart. But it says, and they realized that they had been with Yeshua. Okay. So then if you go to Galatians, Galatians 2, starting in verse 7, reads, but on the contrary, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcised had been committed to me as the gospel for the circumcised was to Peter. So the uncircumcised is everybody that's not a Jew and the circumcised is everybody that is a Jew. Because remember, circumcision, circumcision of the flesh was according to the law. Um, although I'm not going to get into detail about that, but just want to let you know that's what he means by that. For he who worked effectively in Peter for the apostleship to the circumcised also worked effectively in me toward the Gentiles. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that had been given to me, they gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship that we should go to the Gentiles and they do, and they to the circumcised. They desired only that we should remember the poor, the very thing which I also was eager to do. So if you drop down in Galatians 2 verse 11, it actually reads, Now when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. For before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision and the rest of the Jews who played the hypocrite with him, so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, If you, being a Jew, live in the manner of Gentiles and not as the Jews, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh is justified. So let me back up and explain to you what's going on here. So Kepha is eating with the Gentiles. That's the first no-no according to the law. The law has strict dietary regulations. There's certain things that you can eat and can't eat, all right? So he is going and he's eating with the Gentiles. But then when certain Jews, some Jewish people came, he set himself apart as though he hadn't just been eating with Gentiles. So he's being a hypocrite. And if you go to Matthew, Matthew chapter 23, you will see that Yeshua called the Pharisees and the scribes hypocrites almost throughout the entire uh, chapter and we'll go there a little bit later so you can actually see this for yourself but yeah he's letting them know that um, he's letting them know that you, you what you're doing right now is very shady you're pretending to be one way when you're actually doing something else you're being a hypocrite hypocrite um, that word is Hypocrites, which means actor. You're acting like you're righteous when you're not. And pretty much he's doing the same things that the Pharisees were doing. He's doing one thing in, in one setting and then turning around and doing something else in another setting. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, if you being a Jew live in the manner of Gentiles and not as the Jews, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? So basically he's saying, if you're not going to do what's supposed to be right, if you're not going to do the right thing, why are you telling them to do the right thing is what he's saying. Um, we who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So what he's saying right here is the law itself cannot save you. You're not justified through the law. You're justified by Yeshua HaMashiach. But at no point in time does it say that the law is not supposed to be applied to your life. He just said that the law can't justify you okay and it can't because the pharisees were practicing portions of the law but they were not justified because they were not in jesus christ they were not in yeshua Hamashiach. even we even we believed in christ jesus that we might be justified by faith in christ and not by the works of the law for by the works of the law no flesh shall be justified so Yeshua HaMashiach did not come to do away with the law. He came to fulfill it. However, 
he took away the penalty of the law for us. That's what he came to do for us. If you go to Leviticus, and I advise you to read the entire book of Leviticus, because Leviticus lays out all the sacrificial laws. It has um, multiple different laws. It actually um, expounds upon some of the laws that was um, some of the Ten Commandments, actually. And it actually tells you what the penalty for breaking some of these laws was. And more than likely, you were going to die. That's what was going to happen to you if you broke these laws. So Yeshua HaMashiach did not do away with the law. He came and took the curse of the law away from us. And the Romans 6 and 23 reads, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The wages of sin is death. So again, the law, when you broke the law in the Old Testament, the Old Agreement, you were to pay for your, your sin by your death unless you made one of the sacrifices with the animals and so on and so forth. When Yeshua HaMashiach came and became the ultimate sin offering for all of us, the ultimate offering of atonement, there was no more need for the animalistic sacrifices. All we have to do is accept his sacrifice. However, we still have to carry out the weightier portions of the law. And I'm going to get to that in a minute. All right. So Galatians 3 and 20. 29 and if you are Christ's then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise so if you are Yeshua's you are Abraham's seed so he's saying that if you are Yeshua so if you believe in Yeshua HaMashiach then you are Abraham's seed it didn't say that if you are of the bloodline of Yeshua HaMashiach then you are Abraham's seed it says if you are if you are Christ's you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to to the promise. You are Israel. Abraham's seed is Israel. He's the grandfather of, of Yaakov, Jacob, Israel. You are Israel, okay? I, I know I'm like repeating it over and over again, but I just need you guys to hear what I'm saying and listen to the promise to Avram, okay? This is Genesis, Bereshit, chapter 12, starting in verse 1. Now the Lord said to, had said to Avram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And I will curse him who curses you. Remember, we, we saw that in um, Numbers, okay? I will bless those who bless you. And I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. That is a promise of Abraham and if you are his seed you are heirs according to the promise okay it's very important that we 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 pay attention to these things all right so I want to go back to Matthew 23 Matthew Yahoo 23 because I want you to see this what are the weightier parts of the law so in this chapter, it starts off with Yeshua telling the multitudes in the Talmudim, his disciples, that they are supposed to, well, he says that the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Moses' seat, Moses was the original administer of the law. So they, he is saying that they sit in the seat of the administer of the law. And he tells them, he said, whatever they tell you to do, do but don't do as they do. So whatever they tell you, whatever they say do, you do, but don't do what they do. And then he starts calling them hypocrites the entire rest of, he calls the Pharisees hypocrites the entire rest of the chapter. So in verse 23, it reads, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. So justice, mercy, and faith is not a new concept. Yeshua HaMashiach did not come and preach a different word that was different from the law of Moshe or the law of Yahweh. He, what he did was he showed you how you were supposed to be carrying it out all along. The sacrifices of the animals, all the other stuff that was in the Old Testament was meant to, to, um, was meant for you to be set apart 
as Yahweh's people to live differently from the other nations, to be a set apart people. That was the point of it. And all the sacrifices and the amount of times you had to sacrifice and what types of sacrifice, that was to emphasize the need and the necessity for you to constantly be in a state of repentance unto Yahweh okay that was the whole purpose of all of that so look at what it says in Leviticus 19 verse 18 you shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of your people but you shall love your neighbor as yourself I am the Lord where else do we see this we see it in Matthew 22 in verses 36 to 40 when the Pharisees come to Yeshua and they ask what is the greatest commandment of the all of all and he says well the first is to love God with all your heart mind body and soul and the second is just like it love your neighbor as you love yourself all of the law and the prophets hang on these two commands this was in Leviticus 19 and 18 these are not new concepts this has been his law this entire time what Yeshua HaMashiach came to do was take away the curse or the penalty of the law nothing more nothing less okay the law is still in effect. The law is still in effect. So I want to go to Galatians 3, 13 to 14, and it reads, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Okay? Having become a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So let's go back and let's dissect this. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. That's the penalty. That's the death. Having become a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. So Deuteronomy, Devarim 21, starting at verse 22 reads, If a man has committed a sin deserving of death, and he is put to death, and you hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain overnight on the tree, but you shall surely bury him that day so that you do not defile the land which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. For he who is hanged is accursed of God. Okay, Is that not what happened when Yeshua HaMashiach was crucified? Did they not take him down that same day and bury him in the tomb that Joseph of Arimathea had, the, the brand new tomb? He was hung on a tree and he was taken down and buried the same day. Okay? And remember what um, Yahweh had said, even in um, Numbers 25, take all the leaders of the people and hang the offenders before the Lord. This was the curse, the penalty of sin, death. Okay? That the blessing of Abraham, this is verse 14 in Galatians 3, that the blessing of Abraham, so you remember, the blessing of Abraham, um, I gotta remember where it is. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. That's the blessing of Abraham, okay? So the, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus. So these are people who have believed in Yeshua HaMashiach, okay? That we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So just like with Zipporah, who became an Israelite through marriage, she believed in Yahweh because of her husband Moses or Moshe. Just like Ruth, the Moabitess, who declared that she was going to be the people, that Naomi's people was her people and Naomi's God was her God. These are Gentiles in Yeshua HaMashiach. These are Gentiles who have come into relationship with Yahweh. Okay? They are now his people. They are Israelites. Okay? So I know that um, in Acts 11 and 26, it says that they were first called Christians in Antioch and I'm gonna read that to you and when he found him he brought him to Antioch so it was that for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch and the word used there is Christianos so I mean it, it does say Christians um, in the Greek 
But understand this, it says that they were called Christians. It does not say that they called themselves Christians. This was actually a derogatory name that was given to them by the Gentile peoples who had not believed in Yeshua HaMashiach. It's the equivalent of calling someone the N-word in America, okay? Or calling a Jew a... Oh, I'm not, you know what? I'm not even going to get into it. It's the, it's the equivalent of calling someone a derogatory name. That is why they were called Christians. It was not meant to be a religion, okay? It became a religion, but it wasn't meant to be a religion. So I want you guys to understand this. This is just a part of it. I'm pretty sure that, um, well, I'm hoping that Yahweh will allow me to go in even more detail with this. But understand this, if you have given your life to Yeshua HaMashiach and you believe that he is Yahweh in the flesh and the word of Yahweh in the flesh, then you have now become an Israelite grafted into the vine. You are not a Gentile believer and you are not a Christian. You are an Israelite. Okay? Only the Israelites receive the promises of Yahweh, Abraham's seed. Abraham's seed are not Christians. They are Israelites. If you desire the promises of Abraham to come into your life, you have to be an Israelite. Okay? And part of being an Israelite means you have to adhere to the law of the Israelites. But the weightier matters are justice, mercy, and faith. Okay? So you're walking in the fruits of the Spirit. That's how you adhere to it. But you're a set-apart people, which means you're not listening to the music of the world. You're not watching the shows of the world. You're not eating the things of the world. You are living according to the law of your God that you have declared your God, which is Yahweh. And here's the thing. If you baptize yourself or if you've been baptized or if you take communion every first Sunday, these are both aspects of the law. And so now I know I'm probably going to have to do another video. But if you do either of those two things, you are practicing the law of Yahweh, which means if you don't do the rest, you're breaking the law of Yahweh. Okay? And you need to repent and come back into agreement with him unless you take upon yourself the curse. Because when you walk out from underneath the covering of Yeshua HaMashiach, and you deny that he is who he says he is. Because when you say the law is done away with, you're saying he is done away with. Which means you are now under the curse of the law. And you're keeping it. And if you should break one part of the law, you should break the entire law itself. That's what the word says. Okay? And remember what it says in Galatians 5 and 23. Against such there is no law. This is after Paul tells us what the fruit of Ruach HaKodesh are. And it says, against such there is no law. Why would he say that if the law wasn't in place? The problem is the people interpreting the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, they added in subheadings and they added in chapters and they added in verse numbers. None of those things existed in the original scrolls. It was one con con um one concrete letter. So Galatians was not broken up into chapters. Romans wasn't broken up into chapters. The Acts of Ruach HaKodesh, because that's the true name, it's not the Acts of the Apostles. It's the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Okay? He gets introduced in the second chapter of Acts. All right? He's the helper, the comforter. Okay? But anyway, they don't have chapters. They are one conducive letter. Not all together, but, you know, Acts is one letter, Romans is one letter, um, Ephesians. These are individual letters that are not broken up into chapters with subheadings and verse numbers, okay? So when you read in some of these, it says, now, now the just shall live by, no, the law is done away with or something like that. It'll say that in the subheading. You have to understand that if you don't know the true meaning or the purpose of the law to begin with, or if you haven't been given eyes to see and ears to hear, though they might be the theologians, and here's the thing, I am very grateful for the amount of labor that they put into 
um, translating the Bible. I'm not taking anything from them. I'm just saying if Yahweh did not give them eyes to see and ears to hear, you have to understand they're men just like all of the rest of us. They are human and they are liable to make mistakes. I've made many mistakes in this video. I've stumbled over my words. I've backtracked. I've done all of that because I'm human. But Yahweh's law has not gone away. And when you give your life to Yeshua HaMashiach, I mean, truly, you become an Israelite, which means the law of Yahweh now applies to you, but it applies to you the way it was supposed to apply in the first place. And that is by you being a set apart people, communing with your God and repenting from your sin if necessary. Okay. Serving him and only him. All right, you guys. So I'm going to stop right there because this is a lot of information to take in um, and understand this is stuff that I've heard said in the past and I wasn't at a place where I could receive it you know Yoakonon or John 6 and 44 says no one can come to the father unless he draws them I hadn't been drawn yet I hadn't reached this part this this point so I do understand that it might be hard to take in it might be a lot what I ask of you is, by all means, jump into the comments and let's talk. However, we're going to talk respectfully, okay? I'm laying down the rules right now. There will be no arguing. There will be no strife. There will be no dissension. There will be none of that. No name calling, none of that in the comments section. If you should choose to jump into the comment section and have a conversation and that's whether you agree or you disagree with the information that was put forth in this video okay because I'm okay with disagreeing respectfully with someone else and that way we can sit we can have a conversation we can hash it out and if at the end of us conversing we still agree to disagree then so be it I've done my part I can't force it on you but we're not gonna we're not gonna yell at people we're not gonna call people names we're not gonna do any of those things because then I'll turn the comments off. This is meant to open eyes and hearts. Because in the end, Yeshua HaMashiach is going to say, Away from me. I never knew you, you workers of lawlessness. That's what iniquity is. Lawlessness. He said that because these are people claiming that they follow him and they are not observing his law. I don't want that to be you or me. Pray about it. Ask him about it. Read the scriptures that I post below the video. Go to blueletterbible.org. Study it. And if you come to the same conclusion, then you come to the same conclusion. But not understand that I'm making this video because I love you and Yahweh loves you. Alright you guys. Until next time. Shalom. Alakim.